Welcome back. I'm Jeff Kelly with Wikibon. We're here live at the Cassandra Summit in Santa Clara, uh, winding up uh, what's been a really long but really fascinating day, uh, kind of getting to know the Cassandra community and uh, talk to uh, a lot of really interesting people. Uh, and we've got yet another interesting guest on with us today uh, in this segment, Patrick McFadden, Chief Architect at Hobson's. Welcome. Hi. How are you doing? Good. Welcome to the Cube. I'm the last one, so. Well, we say the best for last. <laughs> uh, so why don't we start off with a little bit of information about yourself and your background and, and kind of what Hobson's does. You're in the education services and software field. Yeah, that, I mean, so Hobson's is an education services company, um, K-12, uh, higher education. We, I mean, what we're trying to do is we're trying to help universities, we're trying to help K-12 institutions. Uh, find and retain students. Um, we do things like college applications, which is really one of our more important missions because that's a pretty critical part of, of a student life cycle. Um, things like retention, mm -hmm. trying to keep students in school, which is a big problem right now. Uh, a lot of recruitment. So all of the things that have to do with student life cycle, we're pretty much involved with. So you spoke here today a couple, couple different talks, and we were, we were, you and I were speaking just before we went on air, and uh, you mentioned kind of got a lot of interest in the talk you were giving about uh, kind of developing on top of Cassandra. Yeah. And so talk about that. I mean, what's what's what do you think? Why the interest is so is so strong there, and and what did you focus on in your talk? Yeah. So speaking of education, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had to break out my professor hat. Um, we were doing a, I did a talk on developing applications from scratch with mm -hmm. Cassandra. So it was really kind of starting from beginning and trying to take that application concept through its life cycle. So the conceptualizing it, doing the data model, and then deploying it out. And it was in a 30 minute talk, so of course I was talking fast, but it was more of an overview. And I was really just amazed. It was standing room only. I really wasn't prepared for the amount of interest. I thought that this would be a conference where we'd have a lot of more veterans, but mm -hmm. it was clear, I mean, with the size of this, this year, it's double from last year, that there was a lot of interest for just how do I even start with it? And so I, after the talk, I got a lot of people asking me questions and I, I could tell that a lot of people showed up here trying to figure out how am I going to use Cassandra. Right, what, is, what does that say about the community and kind of the state of Cassandra as a, as a technology when you're, you know, you're getting so much interest kind of people, you know, we've talked to others today about you know, the attendees and they seem to be real, these, these are serious smart people who are ready yeah. to really to take some action. They're not here just kind of you know, thinking about big data. They, they know what they want to do. Right. Uh, and now they're talking about you know, listening to, to folks like yourselves talk about developing applications, really deploying them in production. So, right. um, you know, so what are some of the, I guess, best practices that you shared with the group, and, and you know, what does that tell you about the state of the community? Well, the state of the community is just growing rapidly. I mean, it's gone beyond this early adopter phase. We're out mm -hmm. of that, and you know, there's large customers that are that can talk about Cassandra and validate it. You know, Netflix is pretty. You talked to Adrian earlier, so. You know, everyone says, well, I guess if they're doing it, it's okay. <laughs> so, you know, the, the uh, early adopters like our, like me and then others that have been in this community since point seven or before, we're, we're now talking to people that have, are looking at it the first time with some sort of appreciation, which is good, because we don't have to say, it's going to work now. Mm -hmm. Now we're saying, okay, this is how you make it work. And so, I mean, the state of the community now is really cool because now we're getting a lot of churn. People are uh, moving from company to company that have experience, and so mm -hmm. it's starting to propagate out. Um, so I, I think this is a great place to be right now. So talk about the actual developing applications. I mean, what, what are some of the key challenges specifically focused around trying to build applications uh, on top of Cassandra? Well, right now, the biggest problem that I, I personally had with, you know, when I talk to developers is just getting over that relational model. Mm -hmm. So. Most of us who have been educated in you know, classic computer science classes where we take an app, a data-driven application has always been on something like an Oracle or MySQL or Postgres. And so the data model has always been a relational model. Mm -hmm. Very rarely has it been anything else. And I don't think that that's really even being taught in curriculum right now. So it's just getting past that hump. And it really isn't that big of a deal. I think that more people see it, they're like, oh, okay, it's not so bad. So, okay, we're just storing data. There are some nuance and some twists to it, but it comes with the, what you're getting with the deal. Mm -hmm. You know, Cassandra is going to be available all the time, and hopefully. <laughs> and it, it, you're trading off that eventual consistency and all the things that come with it that are good for maybe some things that you were used to in your relational world, mm -hmm. like, uh, it's like relational integrity and transactions and things like that. So you get past that and it actually starts going pretty fast after that. Mm -hmm. 
So talk a little bit about your experience uh, at Hobson's. Uh, so you know, did you guys start building uh, your applications right on top of Cassandra to start, or did you move off of uh, an another database and uh, when you hit some scaling issues or performance issues? Talk, walk us through yeah. kind of the, the life cycle. Well, I mean, it's, it's a problem that I think a lot of people have is they run into a, a performance brick wall. We had a, um, a system that was collecting, it was running on Oracle, collecting our performance tracking data and our web log data, mm -hmm. and it just wouldn't scale. And we got to the brick wall. I mean, we're either going to have to call Oracle and buy more of it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is exactly and what they, yeah, that's, you know, that's their business model. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, Oracle scales great until you run out of money. <laughs> and then it Unli If you had unlimited funds, it would be no problem. Oh, right? yeah, sure. I mean, that's how we got to the moon, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what we were looking at is an alternative. And MySQL is an option, but I wanted to use something that would scale a little more uh, in a linear fashion. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had already known enough about Cassandra where I felt like that was a really good choice, especially if we're going to try to scale this thing without any knowledge of how this is going to go. I mean, it's going to go to X, and what X is, I don't know. So we needed something that would scale horizontally like that pretty easily. So uh, we started pretty earnestly last summer. We transferred the whole system, and getting rid of Oracle to do that was a really good idea. <laughs> because we just don't have a problem with it scaling anymore. Mm -hmm. It's running in Amazon, it runs great. So um, I think it proved the point pretty quickly. So, uh, so let's talk a little bit more about use cases, just kind of uh, what you guys are doing in terms of education uh, services. And you know, we talked a little bit about uh, you know, applying big data to some of these societal issues, education being one of them. We talked mm -hmm. earlier with uh, uh, healthcare anytime uh, talking about kind of applying big data to, to healthcare. Education is another one of those uh, use cases, one of those areas that's really, uh, you know, we, we hear a lot about it in the press about you know, failing schools and uh, how we need to do better. How are you guys actually trying to make that happen by applying big data? This, yeah, this is a current problem that we're trying to deal with because, I mean, it, it, when it comes down to it, data derives so much, but in education it's so important mm. because there's so much meaning you can get out of data now. Um, how students are progressing, for mm -hmm. instance. Retention is a huge problem. Right. Universities are, <laughs> you know, it's that old thing of the, when you sit at the freshman day and you look to their left and look <laughs> to the right, those people won't be there when you leave. That's the problem that we have mm -hmm. to solve. And so data, the big data aspect of this is we're collecting a lot of data. How do you find those students that are potentially failing? And, you know, that's, that's not a bad mission to have. Mm -hmm. If you have a 50 or 60% retention rate, which is not uncommon, and you can bump that up 2 or 3% or even 10%, those are people that, kids that are finishing college and having an education. Um, there are other challenges that they have, like they're going to be strapped with some debt after that, <laughs> but it, there's still a big data problem mm -hmm. in its core because we're collecting a lot of data about students. All right, let's dig into that. So what, what are the data sources that you're talking about? And, and how has that changed over the last five, 10 years where we couldn't, you know, before the advent of what we're calling big data, you couldn't do some of these things. So what are the sources and what are some of the possibilities now that maybe we couldn't, we couldn't do in previous generations? Well, what we know for sure is that students now, especially, are really active in social media mm -hmm. um, and they love to talk about what they're doing. It's amazing how much information. We have a website, collegeconfidential.com, that is, <laughs> I'm always amazed by it. And what, the mission of that website is really just to have a place where kids can talk about getting into uni universities of various kinds. So like a specific, that maybe they want to get into Harvard or Stanford or something like that. They talk to other people and they, they do compare notes and it's really an interesting place because there's so much data in that. Mm -hmm. And just mining that alone, we've looked at that as real, that's really interesting because you're going to find out that everybody's on the same track and you get some really interesting insights. Um, we, we, I mean, I just go on there and without even using search tools and looking at the forums and seeing what people are talking about or trending and it really gives you an insight of what's on the minds of kids at that time. So uh, even you know, taking like traditional data like grades and things like that, that we've always collected data on. We've never done any kind of data mining on that. Mm -hmm. We should. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are some startups now that are doing that. And it, I think that's one of the exciting things is that education has become a really, uh, it's just a focal point for a lot of startups, a lot of big data startups. Mm -hmm. It's just a strata. Mm -hmm. There's tons of startups that are doing education-based stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity, isn't there? Because mm -hmm. there's just, as you mentioned, there's so much data, social social media data, especially the generation you know, coming up now, the millennials, I guess you call them, yeah. uh, you know, are much more comfortable 
sharing with social media, and, and there's right. just so many new avenues now for you to for you to kind of dig into, especially when it comes to, to education and dealing with kind of uh, the yeah. younger generation. And there's, it's really interesting insights, I think, that we can kind of get in the future, too, is if we just ask questions. I've, one of the things I've always been amazed by is when, you're, when a student is in a cycle of getting ready to go to a university, the amount of questions you can ask them. It's so much more than, say, if you're signing up for an account on Twitter, you know? <laughs> I mean, you can't ask things like religious affiliation on your Twitter account, but I mean, it's a really, there's so much data we get, and some of it's very relevant to the university at hand, but um, there's just a massive amount of data. I mean, pages of applications. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about a college application. Mm. That's literally pages of data, and it's not that we're using it for a bad thing. This mm. is this is used for their betterment, and that's I think that's really the key. So let's dig a little bit more into your services, what you guys are delivering, and mm -hmm. specifically, how are you leveraging Cassandra uh, to kind of serve up? Uh, I'm imagining some kind some type of real-time application uh, that you're support that you're supporting with Cassandra. Talk a little bit about what you guys are doing, and, and yeah. It's not, it's not on the student side yet. Mm -hmm. We haven't started doing it on the student side yet. Really, it's for our own back end that we replace this with. Um, but what it does give us is that real-time look at our, all of our applications mm -hmm. and URLs. How are they doing? How many people are using them? That sort of thing. And that's, mm -hmm. that's pretty important stuff, too. Um, we do most of our traffic in the last couple of days of the year during application decision, <laughs> or the application time. Mm -hmm. That, if you had it, we had it on a 24 hour batch. If you do that on batch, you're missing a whole day of data, which is like half of the most important day of your <laughs> entire cycle. Well, yeah, when you've only got two, two critical <laughs> yeah. days like that, you really. Yeah, you can't. A 24 hour cycle is, is too long. No, no, and that's what we had for a long time. And so we need to have that real time. We have a dashboard set up, mm -hmm. and it just pulls the data real time out of Cassandra, and you can see you know, the nice fluctuations of things, and it's always. It, it, when we have the, the deadline uh, for our applications, which is you know on January 1st, it uh, closes at um, I think 9, 9 p.m. Yeah, Pacific time. Everybody's watching the computer, and you just see this ramp, 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 and it just drops off. <laughs> and that's now being graphed in real time. And we could see if we were having trouble, we could see that pretty easily. And mm -hmm. that is so important because if you think about what our mission is, what we're trying to provide is a good experience. I mean, think of the parents sitting there watching their kid fill out an application and they get a bam, a 503 error. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like their whole life just went boof. <laughs> and that's the deadline. Wow. So we have to make sure that it's ready. It's very cool. It's our mission. So uh, final question, just would love to get your impressions about what you're seeing in not just the Cassandra community, but the whole big data community. Um, you know, we're seeing there's kind of all these competing NoSQL approaches. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's the Hadoop world, but that's you know, more focused on batch, and you've got Cassandra supporting more real-time types of analytics. Um, just what's your take on you know, the last couple of years as we've seen this movement kind of ebb and flow and, and kind of different uh, horses on the track kind of take the lead, and you know, right. Cassandra seems to be uh, gaining some momentum now, and HBase maybe uh, was a little bit hot a little, you know, six months ago. Talk to me a little bit about what you're seeing in the community and, and, and what that means to people like you and the, and the job that you do. Well, there's, there's like some phases that we've gotten over, obviously. It used to be, how do you collect that much data? Mm -hmm. Check that box, done, got that. We can collect a lot of data. And then it was like, how do we analyze that much data? And I think, we've, I think that's a solved problem. I, I believe that's a solved mm -hmm. problem. It's now the nuance of how you do it, and you know there's still a little bit of work there, uh, plenty of churn in that. But now I, I think the, the transition where we're heading is now what do you do with it? And you, last year uh, it was all about how do you compress and crunch this much data. Now uh, I'm seeing more uh, visualizations. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing more dashboard type stuff. People are talking about the use of data, and that's really exciting because it's like we got rid of the hard part. Mm -hmm. You know, the collection, the crunching, okay, got that. Now, let's do something with it. And we're here, I think we're here. Kind of the creative, the creative part is here. Now, you yeah. know, some of the heavy lifting is over. Now, let's really start yeah. to get to get creative and see what we can do with all this uh, infrastructure we've built. Yeah, you hear the word democratization of data. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that before, you know, last year even really, it was that much in that democratization. I, like, I can't imagine everybody having access to data that easy. And mm -hmm. you know, now I think it, it with BI tools as, as they're maturing on top of these solutions, you're getting that now, mm -hmm. real time. 
So, uh, you know, as, as we wrap up, so let's talk a little bit about what you guys are doing in terms of the future and the next mm -hmm. year, two years. What are you guys doing around big data? What kind of uh, innovations are you looking to build? And what are kind of the biggest uh, needs when you're talking to your, your customers and your users out there? Hey, this is the kind of thing we'd like to see. It's really, it's, uh, again, the use of that data. I think that's, we're, we're trying to figure out the best use of that data um, that's going to be the most effective. Mm -hmm. And we collect a lot of data, and what's really unique about Hobson's is we have the K-12 all the way through HE, the higher education. So we can, you know, we can look at a progression over time, and that's, that's a really interesting insight that we have. Um, and that's, we are talking about that now. How are we going to use that for student success to help our universities get the best students that they can and help them find students that may not be found, that are lost, mm -hmm. you know, so to speak. So that's, that's exciting. We're doing that now. It's very interesting stuff. Very cool. And a very, you know, very worthy, worthy goal, as you mentioned. I can't imagine a better goal. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, Patrick, so much for joining us. I uh, really appreciate it. hope you enjoyed your first time inside the Cube. Hopefully, we'll have you back. That was, it was great. All right, fantastic. So we'll be right back to wrap up the day here from uh, Cassandra Summit 2012.